Hey Anirvan, how are you? Hey, doing good, Jedi. How are you doing? Doing great. So uh, I think we are meeting after a while, um, but uh, you know I always say this, right? Uh, if we have two weeks of break, we have something new, interesting came up in probably in the AI space. If it is four weeks, it you know probably the world has changed. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> Too many so, uh, new things. Right? Too many new things, and it is uh, it is increasingly becoming difficult to pick up, you know. And you know, it all started with those LLM piece. Now there are so many applications layer uh, discussion I see, and there's so many. Uh, now is the time where things have started to manifest, right? Um, and uh, I think uh, a lot of innovative companies, uh, progressive companies, are trying to put those technologies into test. To see how they can um, uh, probably benefit from the efficiency, scale, and automation. Uh, so, as we continue to discuss on that on our first segment today, um, there is an interesting topic uh, we will touch upon, and uh, this is uh, we have not touched upon in the in the past in our conversation. And this is about the self-driving cars. Um, we have seen in last uh, four to five years. Um, there have been conversation about self-driving cars and experiments, uh, testing going on. You know, Google, Tesla, there are many other players in that market. I believe in China also they are doing something quite advanced. I saw a couple of days back. But there is something unique that is happening in India also. And the interesting part is, who would have imagined that in a chaotic traffic like our country, um, you know, there are companies who are uh, instrumental in trying out some experiments uh, on uh, self-driving cars uh, in our yeah. gullies. So, two such companies uh, we recently uh, came across. Uh, one of them uh, is Swayat Robots, and the other one is Minus Zero. I'll post the video link probably um, in the chat, uh, the mm -hmm. description uh, section today. So, I wanted to check with you. Um, basically, this article that uh, and and with the video that actually talks about in the chaotic and unpredictable traffic condition in India, um, is this a right environment for probably um, the self-driven uh, driving cars uh, to experiment um, uh, and uh, you know make the cars more intelligent probably with the different sensory part, right? Um, what do you um, think in terms of uh, startups such as Swayat Robots and Minus Zero addresses, uh, what kind of challenges they are addressing and how is it uh, different as compared to maybe the Western companies that we know who have been trying out some of these uh, trials, right? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, in the US especially, if you see there are certain uh, cars which are now running and there are many companies uh, which are trying out this uh, whole self-driven uh, car concept. The common thing across almost all of them is that uh, they they chunk it into different problems and then they try to train, right? So one could be object detection in terms of what is object is it another car, is it something like on the road or is it a deer crossing or, you know, those kind of things are there. Then you look at the next step in terms of what to do and uh, basically, create this modular approach, uh, which they feel is uh, useful. And what they have also done is they have like driven those cars for millions of kilometers uh, across US in different conditions, both weather conditions, like when it's raining, when it's snowing, and when it's clear weather, things like that. And that, this whole thing basically is working for them. And the reason being that uh, mostly the people are following all the traffic rules and uh, generally roads are clear, so they don't expect, uh, some, you know, unexpected to happen. Uh, so, of course, there will be common cases like, you know, someone keeping the signal or something lying on the road and things like that, but those are very few. But again, they have been struggling with some of those uh, corner cases, but more or less, those are working. Uh, on the other hand, if you see in India, it's, it's as you said, uh, chaotic. So it is a stochastic thing. You don't 
you can't predict what the other guy is going to do. So you just can take a probabilistic guess that okay, maybe he will stop or maybe he will not stop, and so you have to stop and all those different things. And it is not just the other riders. You could have you know cows on the road. You could have something you know just lying on the road, some broken down vehicle and all those things. So then the way things are there, it is very difficult. Uh, yeah. People train across all these so many different cases. So what these guys, uh, the startups you mentioned, are trying to do is take a holistic picture, right? And then uh, you uh, try to you know uh, get a sense and you uh, make the car that uh, intelligence in the car aware of what all can be happening and what all can happen, and then take a probabilistic decision and go ahead. So I think that's a very important uh, way of doing things, and probably they could get it right. It may not be completely self-driven, but it can act as a very good assistant for the driver in this condition. Got it. Got it. So I believe uh, Swayat Roberts, um, they use uh, some kind of probabilistic representations and game theory to handle uh, such adversal and unpredictable traffic uh, conditions. So can you shade some light maybe on um, how these probabilistic representations and game theory help in navigating um, in India specific chaotic uh, streets and maybe what are the different benefits that may come from these approaches? Yeah, so uh, as I said, so these are more of specific uh, things where you cannot predict I mean, the, what the person will behave. It is not like if the signal is red, it doesn't mean that the other guy will stop right on the, from the side. So yeah, what they are doing is uh, using these different use cases, what all can happen and then using uh, reinforcement learning and they're also using game theory to predict the behavior of the other folks who are on the road the other road users so based on that so for example if the driver behind me is continuously honking so what am i supposed to do right or if a person is coming from the opposite side on a one-way street which is not expected so how do i know which side he will go that will go toward my right or toward my left so all those different things, how do you predict them? That's where they're using the uh, game theory part of it. So uh, it is to be seen how they will take care of all the possible, mm. uh, you know, corner cases, all the probabilities that can happen. But probably their way of, you know, thinking holistically rather than that modular approach might lead to better results. Okay. And when do you think maybe some of these, um, capabilities or systems uh, that may be commercially available for people to take advantage of it. We will take some time, at least another three, four years away, probably. And again, as I said earlier, so I see them being put into use as a driver assistant thing. For example, you already have certain things like you're moving out of lane and all those kind of warnings are there. So this could be even additional warning for the driver uh, to see, okay, something is there on the road or you should take a left or, you know, someone is coming on your lane, but on the opposite side. So what you mm. do, if you break hard, move away and all those things. So basically they'll help, but I, I think it will take at least a few more years because some of these uh, calculations are also costly in terms of the computing power required in terms of memory and all. So how much can mm. you put in a car? So that also is... Mm. Uh, things that these companies will have to, you know, kind of work again. So let's yeah. see how they come. Yeah, yeah. One thing is for sure um, that, um, you know, by the time these uh, technologies become commercially available in the market, the drivers need to figure out what they want to do in the future. <laughs> that job probably are going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Considering in India, at least, you know, you know, a number of cars are chauffeur driven, um, possibly on a lighter note, they'll have to go through a transformation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that was uh, fun. And I think uh, I'm sure for, uh, for a lot of us, we'll be looking forward to uh, the commercialization of possibilities or actual having those technologies uh, built into 
the next generation's cars. Uh, obviously, it's going to shoot up the onboarded electronics uh, in a huge amount of way. And uh, with new uh, batteries coming in EVs and so on, uh, I think uh, eventually a lot of powers are going to be required to um, run some of these mechanics and systems on board. All right. Okay, Anirvan, it was great catching up. Uh, we'll uh, now switch to segment two, which is uh, focused on enterprise AI adoption. And uh, I look forward to again uh, having a chat with you in a moment. Hey, Anirvan, welcome back to segment two. Hey, we will um, talk about um, an interesting partnership uh, between um, one, uh, which is a consulting giant, and the other one, uh, which is uh, an AI behemoth, right? Uh, so between these two, um, there is an interesting partnership that uh, recently uh, kind of was announced. Um, so OpenAI has partnered with PwC to provide um, ChatGPT Enterprise um, uh, to 100,000 PwC employees, uh, making PwC probably as OpenAI's first resale partner, which is an interesting partnership uh, and I think we are going to see more and more such partnership coming in in the future. This collaboration um, is, is interesting. Uh, I wanted to take uh, your thoughts on what strategic benefits does PwC uh, aim to achieve by integrating ChatGPT um, into um, their workforce? And um, how does this partnership align with PwC's long-term goal in AI and digital transformation? Yeah, yeah. So uh, OpenAI had launched the enterprise tier of ChatGPT, I think somewhere around August, September last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was uh, to particularly target the large enterprises. So it offers like faster, like an unlimited number of interactions, and then it makes it easier to build custom models, some charts and graphs and uh, reports, and different analytics and other tools. So, that is, uh, they criticize that this will enable enterprises to, you know, uh, take ChatGPT and start using it faster in the enterprise. Now, what PwC is seeing here is basically it's attempting to do two things. One is uh, because it has a huge workforce, it's trying to see if it can uh, improve the efficiency and productivity of its employees because many of them do similar tasks. So can you have them give them like a co-pilot or some other facility to OpenAI uh, that will enable uh, the employees to do things better and faster and you know, things like that. Uh, the second thing that they are also attempting to do is kind of become an SI, a system integrator, where they can use GenAI to provide uh, different services to the enterprise customers that they have. The PwC is already offering, you know, digital transformation uh, projects, which are some of the really large scale projects. So uh, for this, if they can use Gen AI, they can also expand the scope and bring in more things under this for digital transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, and considering PwC, PwC's uh, large customer base, um, where, you think uh, or you anticipate um, or which sec sector may potentially benefit most um, from uh, from this partnership and specifically Gen AI driven technologies? Yeah, I think uh, probably uh, they will uh, move towards uh, B2C segments faster, whether it's uh, banking and financial services or retail, hmm. etc. because some of the things like customer support, and operation right supply chain those are easier to handle uh, with ai and along with that they can also take the gen ai uh, part of it and uh, so i think these could be possibly the sectors which may see a faster uh, taken up first and then they can probably move to other areas uh, in their customer uh, segment Got it. Now, with this partnership, uh, that also opens up uh, large opportunities for um, traditional SIs, right? Um, right. Considering that there's going to be, because the SIs own a lot of relationships in the market. And um, considering that uh, now the big players uh, like OpenAI or Google will be more and more partnering with uh, 
the SIs to go to market. Um, mm-hmm. What is the opportunity you think uh, actually opens up uh, for SIs to take advantage um, of this Gen AI-led uh, go-to-market and um, provide probably a lot more impactful services uh, and increase momentum for their own businesses as well as obviously the bigger benefit benefits of the pie for the AI players in general? Yeah, absolutely. So for SIs, the whole uh, digital transformation has been a big play in the last few years, right, with a lot of new AI technologies coming in and a lot of other digital uh, dig- digitalization tools and technologies uh, being available. So Gen AI adds to that, right? So what is going to happen is now they can take use cases which are made easier to implement with Gen AI, uh, right? For example, uh, in customer surveys, uh, summarization of documents and other things in collating data from different sources and creating a new reports and things like that. So these are areas where they can use Gen AI. And in fact, uh, just uh, earlier this week, McKinsey released a report in which they mm-hmm. said that by you know, 2029, that's in another five years, they expect this whole uh, tech services business using Gen AI to generate at least $200 billion of revenue annually, wow. which is a big number, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, these companies, all the SIs, uh, as you said, they already have a good customer base. People are looking to see how they can u- use AI and particularly Gen AI technologies uh, mm-hmm. to do things better. Either one is, of course, improve the uh, productivity and uh, you know efficiency of the employees, where Gen AI is actually very, very good in terms of, especially in areas like customer support or you know uh, operations, uh, right? Similarly, the other thing is how can you look at you know changing and re-engineering your business processes because mm-hmm. those would have been developed 10, 20, 30 years back. Mm-hmm. Taking the tools and technologies available then, but now things have changed. So can you use these new technologies to mm-hmm. look at your business processes, right? Mm-hmm. For example, mm-hmm. if it's supply chain thing, so you have different countries. So where do you put the order against which vendor so that you know you can have the optimum inventory cost mm. and, but you don't uh, you know have a situation where there is a stock out of important raw materials. Okay. So those kind of things you can use uh, AI and Gen AI technologies to ensure that the thing works at an optimum efficiency. And there will be similarly a lot of other use cases. Uh, so I think uh, this is actually going to be very interesting for all uh, SIs in the tech field. Yes, yes. Um, and I think, uh, as you mentioned, that um, the digital transformation is still um, underway for many, many companies, uh, not just um, in, in mm-hmm. our part of the world, but um, even in the West, you know, Western countries, uh, including in the, in the banking sector. Um, and I think the, the, the compulsion of Gen AI adoption or overall AI adoption is going to be in a way uh, a tailwind for uh, driving or accelerating the digital transformation overall initiative faster and um, and even bigger, right? Uh, for yeah. many companies. Um, so I mean, so, this is like similar to what happened in the regular IT services. Right? I mean, if you are going to implement an ERP system like SAP or CRM like Salesforce and all, you could choose to do it yourself. Uh, okay. Fine, but then people go out to system integrators and uh, you know implementers because they feel they have already got the knowledge of implementing the thing. Mm. So they can do it in a better and faster way for them uh, mm. rather than doing the whole we hire people and you don't even know what to look for when you try to hire an expert in that field. And exactly. Program manage the whole thing and ensure that everything was fine. People always go for this kind of a site. So for mm. such digital transformation and other, uh, you know, initiatives, if you have someone who can help you uh, do the thing in a better way, like faster way, implement the whole solution for you, and who brings in knowledge of doing such things in other mm. companies and sector and all, mm. so why not go for rather than mm. you know, uh, you know design, create everything in house, which mm. may be good but may not. Uh, be as good as what you thought it would be. True. So I think uh, we will see probably 
uh, once again a search for uh, roles such as business analysts um, or mm -hmm. consulting in general, right? Uh, right. Understanding the underneath systems or the existing legacy systems, and then also work with the OEMs who are bringing in um, these some of these AI capabilities built into their own platform and products. Uh, how to maximize those benefits uh, through these SIs and consulting opportunities in the enterprise buyers uh, systems, right? Exactly. So probably um, this is going to be as big as uh, at one point of time what we saw a whole ERP and CRM movement, right? Uh, and yeah, I think so. I think so. And probably bigger, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, because um, here you have. Uh, this whole uh, set of tools and technologies that can affect all parts of the business. Yes, yeah. So that's the CRM is only about one part, but here you are looking at the whole every thing. Every layer of the stack, right? Uh, Absolutely. Everything is yeah. going to be transformed. Exactly. And so, and as you said, so the business and domain knowledge of the SI, along with the tech capability, the knowledge of the oh, yes. tools, that hmm. both will become very important for them to succeed. Yeah, correct. So, you know, I think in short, probably we can uh, clearly say that uh, the, like Mac the McKinsey's report mentioned, there's going to be um, a huge amount of opportunities. In this case, they have quoted, I think, $200 billion by 2029, right? Um, right. For the SIs. Um, so, again, the space is uh, becoming definitely it, much required, uh, um, you know, it, it, it got ingested with much required energy and interesting uh, domain sort of push. We'll see a lot of action, hopefully, in the, the coming days and months. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I guess with this, we'll wrap up uh, this week's uh, discussion. And I look forward to connecting with you again in another topic uh, specific to enterprise AI adoption and uh, pick your brain uh, in the coming days. Yeah, sure. Look forward to that. Thank you, everyone.